This Week in Science would like to thank AudibleKids.com for their support of this hour of science programming. No purchase necessary while supplies last. Not a reduced calorie food. Batteries not included. Your mileage may vary. Not to be used as a flotation device. Intentional misuse by deliberately concentrating and inhaling this audio can be harmful or fatal. Some conditions apply. Side effects may include dizziness, blurred vision, unusual clarity of thought, hip dysplasia, headache, upset stomach, sleeplessness, and a tingling sensation in the scalp. For adults and entertainment purposes only. Not to be taken internally. Do not smoke while using. Offer limited to stock on hand. Do not spray on heated surfaces or near open flame. If symptoms persist, discontinue use and consult a science teacher. Refrigerate after opening. Void where prohibited. If you can understand this, you should really cut back on the caffeine. See dealer for details. Do not taunt happy fun ball. Offer not valid in Antarctica, Greenland, Easter Island, or the District of Columbia. Science is strong medicine and should not be inserted nasally. Do not puncture or incinerate. Phenylketonuris contains phenylalanine. Keep out of reach of children. Ask your doctor if www.bigroom.org is right for you. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily represent the views of KDBS or its sponsors. This Week in Science, coming up next, News Only is Directed. Morning, Kirsten. Good morning, Justin. That was an awesome disclaimer. Yeah, that disclaimer was from Sean Clark. He's got a blog that he writes. He's a he's a science science uh, university student, and he's got a blog called BigRoom.org, which was what that little thing at the end was. And uh, he's 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 got another uh, twistribution coming up at the at the end of the show when we play the twistributions wow. like we normally do. Yeah. Good thing, because the writer's strike is on around here. I know, we got a writer's strike, so Justin didn't write a disclaimer. Didn't write a disclaimer. <laughs> I, I called around, I got a friend Eli down there in the Los Angeles uh, regions, and uh, called down there to see if there was any scab writing jobs, you know? <laughs> I'm sure like, come on, are. I mean, I know none of the late night talk <laughs> show hosts make up their own stuff. Well, maybe, maybe Conan, because he used to be a writer. But the other guys don't. No. There's got to be just, they need people to go down there and do some good writing for them. Yeah, but that was great. It was wonderful to get a disclaimer from a, from a, from a minion. Yeah. It doesn't happen that often. Minion Last disclaimer. year we had a... We had a disclaimer well, contest. We yeah, had a bunch that of was submissions. Fun. Right. Yeah, but if you want to uh, twist tribute a disclaimer or a science story, uh, no more than a minute and a half long, email to Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com with uh, twist tribution in the subject line please and uh we'll see what we can do to put it on the air but you know it has to be what i think is interesting or or what i think is interesting it can be what i think is interesting too it could be what you think is interesting but um i'm the only one who listens to it (laughs) (laughs) all right we have a great show for you all today it's this week in science we are here until 9 30 we are let's see it would be 9.30 right now if the clocks hadn't been turned back or if we... Back? Yeah, fall back, you know. We've gone back in time this weekend. Oh, what do we have? I have a, I have a bunch of stuff about China and their space program that I want to talk about today. I've also got stories about the Brainbow. People out there have probably heard of the Brainbow already, but we have to talk about it. And... Uh, Doping of Olympic athletes from the 70s and 80s in wow. Eastern Germany. Yeah, so those are some of my top stories today. What do you have? I got a smattering of thises and thatses, <laughs> all kinds of. I have a printer strike on top of the writer strike that's going on. My printer wouldn't. There's like a line, an, an empty line. Look at this, an empty line in the middle of all my text. How it does is that happen? an empty page. That's not nice. that it's out of ink. No, nope. it's that it's it just, just gets rid of like, a line down the middle of each word. <laughs> it's like I'm Very going strange. to mess with you, Justin. That's all. Feelings of futility in finding balance between biofuel and feeding families fans flames of a futures food fight over ethanol's inflationary effect. Wow. What? Huh? Attempts to reduce U.S. dependence on uh, foreign oil by adding more ethanol to its gas tanks are driving up food prices while delivering very little real energy benefit. Right. Right. Right now, ethanol and and biofuels are still... There's still a lot of research that needs to be done to get good efficiency out of these fuels, and they take a lot of space to grow. And, And we're not using enough of it to actually wean ourselves 
off from of gas. Off of gasoline. Right, that's a which, good point. And the thing is, corn prices have already jumped jumped by sixty percent over the last two years. So huh. here's here's what's a little wicked about corn, which you think, well, I don't ever eat corn. Who eats you know corn on the cob that much, right? Mm-hmm. Well, it's in everything, though. It's an absolute, I mean, that's like one of the main feedstocks for livestock. So even if you're just a straight Atkins beef-eating, you know, junkie, your beef prices are going to go up because the feed prices are going to go up to feed those darn cows and chickens and whatever other animals you might be eating. (laughs) So this is, and now this is like not a huge effect that we can feel right now, but the scary thing is when this starts to go into other countries, there's countries yeah. like Thailand, Uruguay, Ghana are ones that they've pointed at that are very likely going to be places where a lot of this corn is Central and South future. America also. Yeah. We're going to be looking at basically third world nations being uh, bowing to the, to the needs, the gas needs of the first world nations. Or and even their own as their production, you know, as they become industrialized and don't have access to oil because it's too expensive and we're gobbling it all up. Right, uh, which reduces, but the, the whole thing is that it's going to end up reducing the amount of u- land used for food. We're going to start seeing land being clear cut for more farmland. So we're going to start losing more of our uh, tropical jun- jungles, our rainforests, uh, than, than, we have, than we are already. And it's just the whole, the whole cycle. I, I'm, I'm actually pretty negative when it comes to the whole biofuels issue. I hate to say it. And the biofuel does have less greenhouse gas effect, but it isn't it's actually- healthier for people. It still has carcinogenic effects. And it still and it still releases carbon dioxide. Yeah. The bi- the byproducts are still greenhouse gases. Yeah. So it's not as though we're decreasing the use of green or, or the release of greenhouse gases. The the benefit what they're what they're saying is that it basically keeps everything in a loop. So instead of taking carbon that's been sequestered away for millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years or whatever the time length that happens to be, instead of taking it out of the ground where it's been put away and locked away out of the atmosphere. For, for a really long time, we're actually keeping it within the system. So it's basically uh, carbon dioxide comes out of the atmosphere to feed the plants. They produce more oxygen. The plants gotcha. are growing. And the carbon dioxide that gets released is probably no more than what they... What was there to begin with. Right. Hmm. Maybe slightly more from what was taken up out of the earth in the growth process. But that's all basically within the, the, bi- the biospheric loop already. So it's not as though we would be adding anything new to it, which is the problem with uh, natural gas, petroleum, and coal. So so not quite the solution yet. I don't like the idea of the world. I mean, if you could convert gasoline into food and it was a lot cheaper, would anybody do it? Gasoline into or food? Or like oil. If oil, <laughs> if oil, you could turn oil into a type of food that was cheap. Would you do it or would you sell your oil as oil for the big bucks? You'd sell it as the big bucks. And the reverse yeah. is going to happen to the food. As soon as you can sell food for oil prices, mm-hmm. why in the world would you make like, you know, Why in the world would you want to cereal? feed people? Why would you make cereal? <laughs> if, no, really. I yeah. mean, it's going to be an economic decision. Yeah. That's gonna Farmers be- are going to end up making those decisions. And it's going to also depend on where the subsidies go. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, and then there you go. Now we have now we have energy subsidies that mm-hmm. are going to farming, which I think is brilliant, because we should be doing that. But we should be doing it for solar. We should be <laughs> we should have a farm subsidy that would allow you to put solar panels all over your farmland and harvest sun. Right. That makes sense to me. This is like a backdoor approach that they're doing, which is accomplishing the same goal, but not as yeah. friendly. If you're interested, uh, I just watched this wonderful video last night on uh, on the internet's uh, cornguy.tv. Careful it, how, <laughs> careful, make sure your filters are on for that one before you start searching. It's pretty funny, actually. It's a, it's a, it's, they, I think they've only got like two episodes out so far, but it's, it's basically about the uses of corn for, as a, as a fuel source. Yeah. Food versus fuel, and so it is done in a very interesting way. I liked it. I think it's a good thing to, for them to check. La- I'm, th- I'm the, talking the about all the things they might come. accidentally find while looking for corn TV guy. <laughs> it could be bad. Is corn, make sure corn guy dot TV is the actual website. Is the so don't, website. Search, don't Google it. Some things you just don't want to Google in life. Oh my goodness! So recently in the news, um, well, actually, I, I I only heard it whispered. 
along the news wires, whisper, 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 China has sent a satellite to the moon. China on the moon. Yeah, they're they're not on the moon yet, but this was the first of three missions that they are heading up over the next 20 years in plans to get a man on the moon, to get a, a taiko knot onto the moon. Uh, Japan last month sent a satellite to the moon. Uh, China's original plans had been to get... Uh, I think was to get this satellite launched in April, but things hap- happened and they didn't quite get it off the ground. So they, uh, I think about a week and a half ago, they launched a, on a, uh, like a long march missile, I think. They launched their satellite um, up into the orbit of Earth. It sped, spun around Earth a few times and then it was sent off to the moon. It powered its thrusters and went to the moon, and it's now in orbit around the moon, taking 3D satellite imagery and um, surveying the surface and uh, beaming back patriotic songs to Earth. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, I just want to, I just think this is a really important... Republic of Space. Exactly. But I think this is a really important story that has been glossed over a lot in the national news i think you know i've heard it here and there but not really i think this is really important china is has finally like become an independent space power they are on their way to not relying on other nations um they're not in talks with the united and they're not in cooperation with the united states right now they're starting to move on to uh cooperating with russia on future launches uh, towards Mars, um, this is this is something that I think that is the science that's going on could be used as a point of cooperation between nations, um, as opposed to a point of contention, and it could also be used as a. I mean, the word space race, you know, it's been the words have been mm-hmm. used in the the phrase has been used in the past. Mm-hmm. Why not use it again? It promoted research during the 50s and 60s. It boosted our space program. Why not? Why don't we want to see that kind of boost here and now? Well, we do, and that would be great, but it's not going to come through cooperation so much as competition. Right. The, and healthy competition is is always good. Yeah. You know, the, the, I think one of the one of the scary things is back in January, uh, China decided to to show off, you know, their might, and they used a ground based uh, missile and uh, to an anti satellite missile to blow up one of their aging weather satellites. Wait, and they, are you sure? Yeah, I thought they launched it from a satellite and blew up another satellite. No, I they actually, had a satellite that blew up a satellite. No, actually, oh. it was um, it was. A ground-based missile, wow. uh, yeah, and which is that's the big thing. Um, United States and Russia have also done anti-satellite uh, testing. That's a hard hookup. Yeah, they've. Uh, th- this is not some. Th- the fact that it was from the ground, yeah. is what is the the most uh, outstanding thing. It shows that they do have you know some pretty uh, long-range missile. C- capabilities. Well, if you can get a satellite, and, you can go into bol- uh, continental ballistic. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the, mm-hmm. one of the things, one of one of the things is, is like now we need. W- they left a huge pile of junk in the air. With mirror. It, what about mirror? That's the big object. <laughs> it's not. I mean, this is like a lot of little tiny oh. bits and oh, pieces. Right. It's like rubble. It's exploded rubble from the satellite in space that it, in orbit around our planet mm. that has now created a hazard mm. for any nation trying to send anything up into space. And mm. in the past, uh, the United so the United States has a map of anything that's a debris golf of debris mm. that's like golf si- golf ball sized and bigger. Um, and in, in the past, when they when the, the when the Chinese put a Taikonaut into space for the first time, they or in other missile launch not missile but in other launches, they have used United States data on that on that uh, on what's debris. up in yeah. the debris that's in space, right? Yeah. And so now here they have just without any regard, just put a bunch more junk up there, and it's they're going to come back and be like, oh, can we use your data again? <laughs> it's like, can I copy off your test again after you <laughs> go and? <laughs> no. No. But here's the solution, maybe. Yeah, there needs to be we, rules of the road for space launch, that everyone follows. We launch a follows. giant magnet. We have a giant <laughs> magnet satellite that just circles around, collecting the junk up into one big ball. And satellites and, like, whatever else is up there. <laughs> okay. That's a great, that's a great all idea. All right, all right, back to plan B, <laughs> which is the giant vacuum cleaner yeah. that we send up into space to vacuum up the debris. 
Yeah. Anyway, I think that it, the the whole the the whole the the fact that China's up in space, they're doing, they're going, they're moving. They have plans to put a man on the moon, and they might get there before we do again. Mm. You know, yeah. they're really pushing it, and we aren't quite pushing it as much as we used to. So. They might get there before we do, and it, um, it's just going to be—it's going to be interesting to see what happens when that hap- when that happens. You know how how we as Americans respond to that. Anyway, well, anyway, we think we're so I'm big all, and bad. I'm all for the Chinese being on the moon. No, I don't mind it. I think it's—I think, I think it's cool. great. I think we should have—we should set up like. Well, I think when they make the moon base, it should just be like a visitor center. Mm-hmm. You know, regardless of what nation you come from, you go into the visitor center, and, like, <laughs> take turns in the sauna. Welcome to the moon. Insert fifty cents into the <laughs> optical telescope. <laughs> look at look at Earth. <laughs> oh my goodness! All right, this is a this is a green roof. Thing. This is just a small thing I, I crossed over. I don't know. Article in the November 2007 issue of Bioscience describes the history and summarizes the benefits and challenges of having green roofs or roof where you've got like a, you're actually growing a lawn on your roof where you've got like a wildflower garden up there or something like that. Like a sod roof, basically, right? Not just weeds not randomly just, growing. Not out. just weeds in your gutters, <laughs> yeah. but actually a sod roof. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Although they're more expensive to construct, they, it says uh, that the green roof can reduce energy costs during a building's lifetime, uh, controlling storm runoff, providing havens for wildlife so you can have lots of birds and stuff surviving up in there. Uh, it seems like it would be a good place for rats, too, for some reason. I don't know why. Except, no, well, unless Maybe you had birds of prey. Squirrels. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, not very common in the United States and Japan, but uh, European countries, mostly Germany, uh, are really urging the widespread adaptation. Wow. So this is kind of an interesting... So in the long term, they say there are you know, cost benefits to this. There's a photograph of this uh, of on this on the... Uh, where is it? The magazine again. The Bioscience Magazine, 2000, November 2007 issue that shows the California Academy of Sciences building in San Francisco mm-hmm. that's got a uh, almost now complete uh, green roof on the new structure. Probably allows a lot of insulation and... Um I would, I would imagine it would help to regulate the building temperature quite a lot. Yeah, it seems like an interesting idea. I just don't, mm-hmm. could, you could never like mow it. Yeah. Like it couldn't be grass because <laughs> like you said, it would just turn into like a weed thing. So is it like a, mo- and San Francisco is always moist. Like around here, anything would dry up and then you have a fire hazard on your roof. First 4th of July, you're <laughs> going up in flames. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, doping, doping, doping. Wow. Doping, doping. This isn't very green, and it wasn't very green. Back in the 70s and 80s, East Germany had a program of systematic doping of its Olympic athletes. Uh, athletes have uh, have uh, have stated that they did not know that the vitamins that they were taking were anabolic steroids, uh, but they took them anyway because that they. That was the vitamins. That I were, those were the vitamins what they were supposed to take. Steroids? They were. Um, so this study <laughs> was a, a two-year study of fifty-two. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> two two-year study of fifty-two Olympic and elite former East a- East German athletes, and um, their sixty-nine children. And it's interesting. The results are really, really striking and interesting. We, uh, among the children, there's a high rate of physical and mental handicaps, and more than a quarter of the children have allergies, and 23% have asthma. Um, uh, within within the the athletes themselves, many of them had a high, or, or there was a higher rate of depression and suicidal tendencies and uh, the need for therapy for psych- psychiatric issues than the general public. There's also a higher higher rate of cancer among all of the individuals within the study. So uh, it turns out that there's just an oh, and within with all those, 32 times 32 times the rate of stillbirths. With among the athletes as well, so there's just all these all these things that have and have gone wrong with the athletes and their children, and it just goes to show that even though you might think I can do whatever I want to myself for the yeah. short term gains, you possibly are going to be affecting future the future generations. generations. I mean, it is, I'm, and I'm it's I'm I'm going to to go with the concept of epigenetics to explain what's happening with the uh, the. 
the, ne- the, the offspring of these athletes, that, it, that there's probably some change in the epigenetic controls um, that's leading to all these problems. And it, there's, there's so much that, uh, you know, drugs, you know, steroids, whatever it happens to be that you can, that can lead to not just problems within your lifespan, but beyond. Wow. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a really, really quite a, quite a striking study in my, in my thoughts. Got an email from a a minion here. Uh, The title is Twist, A Man Ahead of His Time. Oh, yes. Guys, love the show. Listen to the podcast every week. You are my religion. Religion? Huh. Church hmm. of Twist. Say yes. ten disclaimers and you will be forgiven. <laughs> disclaimer, 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 <laughs> disclaimer. <laughs> Just a head, uh, heads up in case we haven't seen this. Uh, another of Justin's ideas getting exploited for the greater good. And other people making money on it, maybe. Dynamos have been installed in the internal generators of the cycling, elliptical, and Stairmaster aerobic machines at a uh, bunch of California fitness uh, machines in their, one of their... 23 Hong Kong gyms. It's powering lights and TVs. Yeah, you, you, you came up with that idea a while back and told someone to come up with it. And while it might not have been enough electrical power for one person in a household yeah. to do a lot, a and gym. a gym full of bicycles exactly. and treadmills. Well, and this is the thing. Maybe Great. it's not enough Rowing to pay machines. your own bills. But if everybody does plug in, the cumulative effect would be huge. Right. Great. Why waste all that energy? Right. There's another another one in this. Uh, also, there's a ticket gate uh, in uh, built by the East Japan Railway Company that has installed a mini generator pad under the ticket gates. So every time somebody steps on the pad, it creates 100 milliwatts of energy, which is very, very little. That's enough. Right. That's a, what does it say here? Enough to one, light 100 watt. One one thousandth of a second. For a hundred watt light bulb, but you know, maybe fifty watt light bulb. That's two one thousandths. One thousand. It's one one thousandth <laughs> of a hundred watt bulb for a second. Right. But with seven hundred thousand people using the station every day, eh, they're like, eh, we'll just see what happens. Maybe we can keep a light bulb on all day. <laughs> all day long. Oh, go on vacation. Take a lot of photos. Nice 2D images that you take home. Mm. Well, some researchers at the University of Washington are taking images off of Flickr, the online photo sharing website, and which now has more than one billion photos wow. in its library, um, have, have looked for landmarks and are making 3D images of land, well-known landmarks that people take photos of all the time using composite photographs. Of, that people have taken on their vacations. Uh, the way that it works is basically taking multiple viewpoints from a scene and finding the same point between mm-hmm. each of the each of the different viewpoints and, and correlating depth and and size from the different viewpoints and the common point. Hmm. Yeah. So uh, it's what they're what they're hoping to do. They're building these three D reconstructions of individual buildings. They've done the Statue of Liberty, um, Notre Dame, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Um, they've they've used all they've they've done three D re- reconstructions of all these buildings. It's the first step in trying to actually recreate an entire city, and so to actually be able to three D render a city based on okay. There's there's a Spider Man game. That's out for the Xbox 360. That supposedly like does like Manhattan properly. Like, like you mm. if you live on a street in Manhattan, you're like, oh my gosh, that's actually the building that I live in. It that's actually neat. looks like that. It's that many stories, has that many windows. Kind of, kind of crazy. It's kind of it's that's getting there. So maybe in the future you'll have like some kind of a more 3D realistic video game effect based on actual photographs. One place we can hide when the robots take over? Where? The water, right? Yeah. Well, no. No. Thanks to uh, <laughs> Twist Minions, Jason Etheridge and David Morgan, who both separately sent me a link to a uh, popular mechanics story. The 21-foot-long Interceptor can travel at 55 miles an hour. It's designed to be both piloted remotely and autonomously. Yes, autonomous. a robot boat. That is now going to be patrolling waters of, well, so far, Israel. Looks like the British have purchased some. Singapore has got them in their navy. It can be mounted with a machine gun, possibly other weapons. One of the things they're thinking they can, they can use this for 
the Barbary Coast, where we've been getting lots of reports of pirates. Pirates, yes. Kind of a hard area to patrol for any nation state because all the naval superpowers aren't really located in the area. They just sort of travel through. So robots. So robots. Why not water-bound robots? the waters. I love it. That, that means they can shut down all sea travel. That means no more lead-filled toys for our children from China <laughs> if the robots <laughs> take over the... Uh, oh, was wait my a favorite. second. Hey, speaking of robots and children... Huh? Adam, robot Adam, children. Ro- not robot children, but robots and children. Adam Hinterhauer, uh, a freelance science writer I met at the Science Writers Conference, who lives in Madison, um, Wisconsin. He sent me a story about... Real life robots, a state of the art humanoid robots called uh, Sony QRIO, that was uh, used in in uh, child care situations by a group down at the University of California, San Diego. They had these robots that react to facial expressions and respond to touch. So they're very interactive robots and they don't just, you know, do a programmed set of maneuvers. They actually react to what you're what you're doing. They tested these t- toddlers in this child care room at the university and for 45 sessions, averaging about 50 minutes each. And the kids loved it. They like interacted with the robots in the same way they would have re- interacted with another child. Um, they liked playing with the robots more than they did, say, a teddy bear. They would beat up a teddy bear, but they would touch the robots gently. Yeah. You know, So they actually treated the robots as if they were alive, almost. Um, then, they, for a few sessions, they downgraded the robots' performances so that the robots just did pre-programmed sets of maneuvers and didn't respond and were not interactive anymore. And the toddlers totally lost interest. They were like, okay... I'm bored with you now. And so the toddlers would go off and play with their teddy bear because that's more cuddly and nice. Or they'd find a new toy to play with. Again, they tried more sessions with these kids, made the robots interactive again, and once again, the children decided, what is that? (laughs) (laughs) Some bomb is about to go off in the background. There's something going off in the background. You know what? I think it's probably my cell phone. How do, how do you have a <laughs> signal in there? What I kind have of no idea. thing running off plutonium or something? A radium know. phone? What do you got? Anyway, you these, get a these, to- these robots and toddlers were in the, it's printed in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And uh, it's very close. This technology is close to getting to a point where we might be able to interact very closely with robots. Maybe they're going to evolve soon. Well, it kind of makes sense. Like, the, the kids can interact very well and play very well with a robot that's just a little bit interactive. It doesn't have to talk or anything like that. It's like I watched my uh, four-and-a-half-year-old play with my 11-month-old, and, yeah, the 11-month-old, she can't talk. She can't walk quite uh, on her own yet. She's not, you know, doesn't have all the skills a uh, four-and-a-half-year-old's used to playing with. And so he compromises. He, okay, she can't talk. Okay, she's not mobile. We can't run around. All right, we're going to sit in one place, and we're going to put these blocks together. He, like, finds out what it is they can do interactively together, and that's how they'll play. Mm-hmm. Same thing with the robot. They'll just downgrade to an extent, but if the robot's just not showing any interest or not, you know, playing or paying attention, then yeah. the robot's done. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's, I think, it, I think it, it's going to be an interesting uh, test to discover at what, you know, so right now toddlers are interacting with robots on a on an interest level um how much further do robots have to advance before humans will you know adult humans will um tod- toddlers aren't human what am i saying <laughs> <laughs> that adult adults, human beings uh, adults will uh, interact <laughs> with robots on an equal level or on an, a level of continued interest i'm telling you it'll the be, first that'll be interesting to see what what has to come about in a in in artificial intelligence and robot technology to do that that first pirate that steps onto mm-hmm. a robot boat and is surprised to find no crew and no booty and nothing but robotic um arms gonna be that's that's gonna be our first real real solid interaction. Pirates! It's pirates versus robots on the open seas. <laughs> what year is this? I don't know, but it is really this is some sci-fi drama. I don't know, but that was the, definitely this week in world robot domination My for goodness. sure. We will be back in just a minute. Must take a short station break, and when we return, we'll be back with Dr. Michael Stebbins, the weird from Washington. Stay tuned. Life in our 
into space Please send some over to my place I'm off my face There's rocket ships from other stars Observing us from planet Mars That's not far All the world is around us You want t-shirts? We got them. You want music? Got that too. The This Week in Science World Robot Domination t-shirts and the 2007 Science Music Compilation CD are now available. Go to www.twis.org for more information. We want the money. Yep, This Week in Science is looking for sponsors and advertisers. If you're trying to reach a new audience, sell a product, or support a good cause, Contact me, Kirsten, at thisweekinscience.com for information. And we're back. More This Week in Science. That's right. And on the line we have Dr. Michael Stebbins from the Federation of American Scientists, Scientists and Engineers for America. And let's bring him on the line. The Weird from Washington with Dr. Michael Stebbins. Howdy. Howdy. How are you today? I'm well, thank you. How are you? Oh, fantastic. We've got great weather here. It's like 80 degrees. It's nice. Yeah. Excellent. You, do, you guys hey. got, do you guys have the cold? Uh, it is getting a little dreary here. It's starting to feel like fall. So there you go. Yeah. They, California thought it would try that for like a week, and then it was like, eh, no, never mind. <laughs> That's okay. I'm actually heading off to Ireland next week, which is actually going to be, uh, from what I hear, wet. Um, it's always <laughs> wet in Ireland, yes. Yep. Yeah. Speaking of fabulous weather and global warming, though. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, of course, we can launch right in. See? Nice transition, right? Perfect segue. So, so um, last week, uh, uh, actually, it was uh, came out the week before last, uh, the um, uh, Dr. Julie Gerberding of the uh, uh, Center for, for Disease Control was giving testimony uh, in front of the Senate. Yes. And as it turns out, a lot of her testimony had already been uh, redacted, so to speak, by mm-hmm. the White House Office of Management and Budget. So what we would expect to happen is that when all of this came out, that Dr. Gerberding would be a little upset at the, at the office or that she would come out and say that, that uh, well, uh, you know, something very uh, um, you know, important about, about the, uh, the actual stuff that was redacted. But what she did was actually came out and said that she was upset with the press for covering the fact that her uh, testimony had been edited. What? Was, yeah. So uh, going so far as to say but uh, that she thought this was the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. So yeah, because correct. I mean, the stories really should have been about the potential for disease spreading in new regions and health implications of heat waves and drought mm-hmm. and discussion of uh, you know, what vulnerable citizens would actually might have to go through. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but we did actually get uh, quite a bit of press on the fact that it was edited out. So now it's true that the Office of Management and Budget actually really can edit this stuff out uh, normally and actually does quite a bit of the time, but they deleted half of her testimony. And so uh, now while they're, um, uh, you know, that, that shouldn't be a, a big problem that they, they do the editing, we're removing half is, in, is very interesting and is a yeah. news story. And that the edits themselves actually are, are you know, actually what are, they don't took happen out. in a bubble. Yeah. This is all part of, of, of a much larger problem that has been going on. Now, 
the story actually got more wheels, not because of the fact that it was edited, but because of the White House press secretary's response to the uh, to the to to the edits themselves, where she actually made the claim that there are public benefits to global warming. And, and she said, and the, so the decision on the behalf of the CDC was to focus that testimony on public health benefits. There are public health benefits to climate change, end quote, uh, which, of course, Dr. Gerberding did not focus on in her, in her testimony to her credit. Wow. So to look on the bright side of life. Hey, you know, there, uh, there is somebody out there. There's a guy out there from England who's written a book all about like the, the bright side of global so warming right. yeah, or climate change. I don't often give financial <laughs> advice or investment advice, but uh, housing in Greenland is still dirt cheap. Well, they don't have dirt, <laughs> but it's still cheap. See? See? There's, 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 <laughs> well, there's hey, dirt underneath all that ice. So yeah. There's some rocks. There's not a lot of like soil. Yeah, so. that's true. Well, <laughs> bummer. So, in, in context of all this, actually, the BBC did a poll that asked um, how much people would be willing to sacrifice to curb climate change. Mm -hmm. And most, you now they, they actually pulled 22,000 people in 21 countries. That's a lot. What they found though, is that four out of five people said that they were prepared to change their lifestyle, even in the U.S. and China, wow. the world's two biggest emitters of CO2. So overall, about 80% of Americans actually uh, responded and said they agreed that individuals would definitely have to make lifestyle changes to reduce the amount of climate change and gases they produce. So this is actually good news. 80% of Americans are actually cool with, with changing their lives. However, when you actually say, you know, who would support a, a higher tax in favor of raising, uh, to, uh, in order to uh, support uh, new types of energy development and encourage individuals and businesses to use uh, less, uh, you know, the numbers dropped significantly right. to around, you know, 45%. Uh, I so think so. People we're willing just to change wanna... your lifestyles, just not pay more. Right. People want to have control over the action actions that they take. They don't just want their money to go off into something. Here's an idea, though. Yeah. Why don't we educate people? Why don't we go backwards in time through the history books and the accounting books of previous Check. administrations look. and look at money we invested in research and development and then show people where those dollars ended up creating? I mean, it's cell funny phone... you say that. Oh, uh, actually, that's precisely what has been done on us on uh, several occasions. In, in fact, uh, a report from the National Academies of Science uh, estimated that 80 percent of new jobs in the last century were a direct uh, result of new technologies. That at some point, someone had to invest in those technologies. Yes. Now, what we haven't figured out is, you know, and what's difficult to do is actually figure out which parts of those technologies were actually from federal funding. But yeah. we do know for sure that the biotech industry alone was, uh, you know, seated straight right on the back of NIH funding. Well, a and lot that of the discoveries that were made with NIH funding, you know, led to a, a, a large number of the companies in the biotech industry being formed. Yeah, well, I do know that a large that the the proportion of w where money's going has been changing, so that it's uh, basic research is not being funded as much as it once was, and now it's much more application driven. So there has to be some kind of application for what you're doing before you get the money, and there's like the big push towards um, the commercialization and of of research, so that anything that uh, I guess the, the technology transfer is the term that people are calling it. Correct. And this is a, a lot of this is the result of the Bay Dole Act, which actually encourages researchers who use federal, who, who get federal dollars to mm -hmm. actually, you know, take uh, their inventions and discoveries, and and allows them to capitalize them. And actually, that that also is credited uh, uh, with uh, a lot of the biotech boom. Right. Now, speaking of funding, actually, it's appropriations time of year. It is. And so we actually figure out what we're going to get next year. And, um, is it Christmas time? Do we get stuff like in our Christmas, stockings? <laughs> except for the president's threat to veto most of the bills. Uh, but, the, but when we actually break down the Senate versions of the of the spending bills and the president's request, particularly when we're talking about the health and human services budget, we actually see that, for example, that the president is is well below the Senate and House uh, numbers on uh, uh, funding Medicare Parts B and D, Medicaid, uh, the National Institutes of Health is actually a significant change um, where uh, it, the Senate budget uh, proposes reducing the national, actually the, the president's budget proposes uh, reducing the National Institutes of Health budget by $310 million, which is about 2%. And the Senate mm -hmm. version would actually boost
boost NIH funding by $1 billion, by, which is 3.5%. Wow. Yeah. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy. Now, the NIH increase would pay for an additional 400 grants compared with fiscal year 2007 and 700 more than the president's budget when, they, when you break it down. So even this, but even the Senate's increase wouldn't keep pace with uh, biomedical inflation rate, which is about 3.7%. So it's still not keeping up with the Joneses. Now, the NIH needs $1.9 billion is the estimate, or a 6.7% annual increase from 2008 to 2010 to restore it to the spending ability it had in 2002. So uh, the president has threatened to veto 10 of the 12 spending bills, and this is, of course, one of them. So let me, so, let me get that right. One, one week in Iraq would pay for the entire scientific budget of the United States? Well, the di- actually, the difference in all of the spending bills combined and the, uh, between uh, what uh, Congress is proposing and uh, what the president uh, requested was $20 billion. So most of it was offset, but you can, you can in fact, contrast that against the president's $200 billion request for the wars in Iraq and Af- Afghanistan. So it's uh, one-tenth of the, <clears throat> of the budget request for the wars uh, is the difference, and the president is going to veto them. Um, so that's uh, sort of startling. Yeah. Now there's, uh, you know, all sorts of other areas too where there's there's major differences. So t- what's called Title VII student loan assistance. Uh, uh, the president uh, proposed the budget being ten million dollars, and of course, you know, the House and Senate were uh, uh, one point eight nine and, and two hundred twenty eight million dollars respectively. So there's a huge gap there. Uh, you know, where the Senate and House are actually looking to fund student loan assistance at a much higher level than the president would like. So. I, I feel like my four and a half year old. Everyone needs to do what they can do themselves. I feel Come like on. I feel like my little boy Sebastian right now, like when he was looking at me when I was trying to explain money to him, <laughs> like why we couldn't just go to the bank and get more money to buy that car that he saw. <laughs> I'm like, no, they don't just give you money. What? Yeah, <laughs> well, well, in this case, it, no, they do kind of give you money. It's just you have to. They argue about how much they're going to give, and yeah. and actually, the discrepancy of twenty billion dollars sounds like a lot, but in 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 relation to the rest of the budget and what we've spent on 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 uh, other things, is is really very small, and yeah. it, it's uh, uh, it certainly isn't uh, uh, one would think isn't enough to to shut the the um, uh, shut down the government, uh, which is you know something that is a distinct possibility, but. Well, I'm saying, really, what's going to probably happen is there'll be a continuing resolution, and we'll be actually. But what that will mean, since we're on a continuing resolution now, is that actually our government will be working off a budget from 2006. Okay, so we'll be we'll actually be two years behind. behind. Yeah. So basically, the continuing resolution basically says, okay, we'll use the numbers from last year. Hmm. So we're doing that now because uh, the Republican uh, House and Senate uh, in 2006 punted on all of the spending bills and basically said, okay deal with it next time, next year. Right. And now we're looking at there being a problem getting all of these through the Senate. Uh, the House has actually made their way through all of them. So, um, so yeah, that's where we're at with that. Good times. I know. That's awesome. great. <laughs> 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 well, we can just, uh, you know, hope for the best, hope that, uh, hope that, you know, science gets a little bit more funding in yeah. its pocket. And, need, science yeah. needs to earn it, though. Do you, do you yeah, want a funny one before I go? One funny one, yes, okay, please. This is a funny one. Okay. So at an October 9th UN conference, uh, Christina Roca, who is the U.S. representative to the UN conferences on disarmament, claimed that the U.S. nuclear forces are not and have never been on hair trigger alert. Oh, I, yeah, I know the story. All right. Yeah. Which is. We never have been. Completely untrue. One hundred percent untrue. We have nuclear weapons on alert right now, and 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 you know, and it's very very odd. And she of course knows this, so it's a very very strange uh, claim to make. And of course she was corrected, and, and everyone in the room sort of like sat up straight and said, "What?" <laughs> right. Oh, I think we have an air one. base around here that used to be continually flying with uh, nuclear weapons on board, ready to go somewhere. We have no weapons. <laughs> oh, what? Weapons yeah. of mass destruction? No, we have none. But we nope. do. <clears throat> but Send we our do. inspectors yeah. to Davis, California. <laughs> uh, they won't find though. anything. So, there you go. <sighs> Radio oh. Thanks again, guys. Fabulous news. Thanks. Thank you so much. Dr. Michael Stabbins, yes. author of Sex, Drugs, and DNA, in paperback now. <laughs> have a great have it's a getting g- less and less enthusiastic <laughs> <I know. laughs> have a great we have a great two weeks and we will be talking to you again oh gosh just before thanksgiving wow. yes 
Wow. I'll, I'll try and give us something to give thanks for. Give thanks. Yeah, that's yeah a good one. that'd be fantastic. <laughs> Take what care. Bye. Bye. That was the weird from Washington with Dr. Michael Stubbins. And we have a little bit more yet to go. I've got oh. some twist tributers. Oh. Yeah, you don't have to jump into <laughs> stories. Don't worry. I've got a couple of twist tributers here. The first is Sean Clark, who gave our uh, yeah, he was our the, disclaimer, the disclaimer at the beginning today. of the hour. And the second one is Michael Taylor, who is a uh, science and math teacher at Hercules Middle School and High School in Hercules, California. So uh, let's get on with it. Can the complexity of microbial fuel cells be explained in 90 seconds? Sure, it's simple. Microbial fuel cells work because oxygen sucks. Any chemical reaction is just a bunch of atoms fighting over who gets each other's electrons. In a battery, chemicals at one end are sucking electrons through a wire away from chemicals at the other end, and a device in the middle of the wire can use the force of the electron suckage to power electrical circuits. A microbial fuel cell does the same thing with bacterial biochemistry. As bacteria break down the molecules in their food, they end up with leftover electrons. These extra electrons get used for a lot of things, but the important one here is respiration, where electrons are pulled through a series of biochemical reactions called the electron transport chain, which uses the force of the electrons being pulled through to regenerate used up biochemical energy. In air-breathing organisms, what's providing the electron-sucking force is oxygen, which is the second most powerful electron-sucking element in the universe. Normally this all happens inside the cell, but some bacteria have ways of allowing the electrons to be pulled from outside the cell, such as long electrically conducting proteins called nanowires. To make a microbial fuel cell, we give these bacteria a carbon electrode to grow on in an oxygen-free environment. Then we run a wire from this electrode, away from the bacteria, and connect it to an electrode somewhere else where the oxygen is. Like a glutton desperately sucking a milkshake through a crazy straw, oxygen can then suck electrons all the way from the molecules of bacteria chow through the bacteria and up the wire, providing the same kind of electron-sucking force that batteries do. If you've enjoyed this explanation, or even if you haven't, please let me know at my blog at www.bigroom.org. Thank you. Robotic cars attempted to perform various tasks on congested sea streets in the just-completed 2007 DARPA Urban Challenge. DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, a department of the Pentagon, sponsored a similar event in 2005 where unmanned autonomous robotic vehicles had to successfully navigate the Mojave Desert. In that event, Stanley, a modified Volkswagen engineered by Stanford University robotics team, took the prize. Denying their attempt, the young upstarts from Carnegie Mellon University, with the financial assistance of such giants as GM, Google, Intel, and HP, had their modified Chevy Tahoe, nicknamed Boss, kick some robot hiney. Stanford came in second on the 100-kilometer course of real-world complexity. All the cars made their own decisions. No remote operation was allowed. A brash Virginia Tech team placed third behind CMU and Stanford to take home a piddling half million dollars in prize money. GM, which sells Humvees to the military, hopes the championship of their sponsored vehicle will demonstrate the ease of which their cars and trucks can be converted to autonomous control. The Pentagon hopes to put such vehicles on the battlefield by 2015 to help automate many tasks that might normally put soldiers at risk of roadside bombs. So circle the year 2015 as the new official date of world robot domination, as dictated by the U.S. government, although no firm timetable will actually be given. The sponsor, DARPA, was previously known as one of the key forces behind the invention of the Internet. Sorry, Al Gore. You got your Oscar and your Nobel. Be happy. This is Mike Taylor signing off. Thank you, Twist Tributors. Awesomeness. Awesome that was day. fantastic. In the <clears throat> colorful, uh, yeah, 2015 robot, world robot domination. I like the whole idea of cars driving themselves. It's just, mm. you know, I, just the whole military aspect of having, the mm. automated military still scares me. I mean. Yeah, I had a, I had a good interview with uh, one of the creators of Stanley from Stanford University at the last AAAS meeting at last Feb this February. And uh, he his goal, you know, he does the military stuff, but his goal is to get cars on the highways in the public's hands that are autonomous. And, Absolutely. Yeah. more drunk drivers kill Americans than terrorists ever yeah. have. Or probably even any war. We've probably lost more people to drunk drivers <laughs> than we have all the wars combined that we've been in. I, I don't know about that I statistic. Have a feeling, You'd have to I, check that statistic. I have a feeling that's pretty darn accurate, even though I pulled it right out of my hat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're making it up. <laughs> Researchers at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts, published in Nature, a pretty picture. Oh. Hmm. They call it the brainbow. Brainbow. Somewhere over the brainbow. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I couldn't help it. Uh, yeah, these researchers has, have used transgenics or uh, knock-in technology to create neurons that express colors. And basically the way it works is like an RGB screen, like a computer monitor or your television screen. Um, different colors. So th- there are four, four genes, four color-producing genes um, that produce yellow, red, blue, or an orange or a green. And they're controlled by a, tra- a, a, a recombination system, a genetic recombination system called Cray-Lox. That's C-R-E-L-O-X. What happened is they, tra- they put these genes into specific cells within the embryonic mouse. So they're placing it into these embryonic stem cells of the baby, little embryonic mice. And as those mice grew, the uh, cells would divide and um, different recombination would occur for each cell. So different subsets of those four genes would end up getting expressed in each cell so that one cell might have yellow and blue, another cell might have yellow and green or red and blue. And so instead of four colors, the combination ended up being upwards of 90 colors. And so Mm -hmm. when they sliced through a section of one of these mouse brains, they were able to see basically a rainbow mishmash of colors from of, of up to 90 colors of, of all sorts of different neurons. And it's not just a pretty thing. And you can go online and you can search for brainbow and images this online. This brain slice of a mouse isn't just beautiful. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's not just beautiful. It's functionally <laughs> significant. It's going to allow researchers to get a lot more information on the interactions of neurons and how neurons connect to one another. So whereas before you had a nissel stain, which just stains everything kind of a purpley color or, you know, a silver stain, um, you know, that where everything is kind of a wash of one color or in the past where they've been able to maybe get two colors like yellow and red or green and red to show up in a mouse brain. Um, now with all these different colors, they can actually differentiate specific neurons for lengths through the brain. So maybe they can right. go through like for long distances within a mouse, mouse brain that's less than a centimeter, but they can follow a neuron over long distances and see how it branches and connects to other neurons. So what kind of interconnectivity there is. And so it's going to be really, really amazing to see how researchers use this new technique to give us more information about the brain. Very cool. Yeah. Researchers at the University of Manchester have developed their own uh, uh, high fashion, high tech battery powered textile yarns. It can be used to make clothing that will glow in the dark. Yarns have been developed by the William Lee Innovation Center, based at the, Univer- uh, the university's School of Materials. It has potential to be incorporated into clothing worn by cyclists, joggers, children trick-or-treating, people at clubs, people just trying to get more visibility on the street. So this is, this is a pretty wild uh, in light-emitting fabrics. Mm-hmm. So just if you can imagine, you know, putting on putting on those jogging those jogging pants. Forget the reflector, because here's what here's one of the one of the uses of this. Right. You one don't example. Need reflective fabric, it actually glows. Exactly. So <laughs> say you've got two people jogging at night wearing all the reflectors, the reflective jacket, the little reflector hanging off the neck, shoes that got reflectors taped to them, two joggers on a dark path at night <laughs> colliding because they couldn't see each other. Why? Because nobody was emitting light for anybody else to reflect off of. So this way, they're actually putting out their own light. That's just, a, it's going to be pretty nice. I can't wait. I'm, I really want to wear, like, that's pretty cool. glow-in-the-dark clothes. That's uh, be fun. Final quick headline so I can give a rapid rundown. Uh, carbon nanotubes being used to with in conjunction with radio waves to zap cancer cells. A uh, chemical called chloramphenicol is being used by researchers to get rid of a fungus called chytridiomycosis in, that's uh, responsible for killing one-third of all frogs since 1980. Is that what's been doing it? It's one thing, yeah. And uh, 
Disappearing bees, we talked about colony collapse disorder a lot this year, and a while back we reported that the uh, that a virus known as IAPV has seemed that has supposedly have been come that has supposedly come from Australia is responsible. Researchers from the US Department of Agriculture's Bee Research Laboratory went back to check on it again, looked at samples from 2001 and 2004 from here in the United States, Pennsylvania, and Israel found that the virus has been here all along. So not it, the virus. it might not. not the virus. And nobody has actually yet, like, no, it's defini- not, it's no one not has killing defini- bees. No one has definitively shown that it does kill bees. It is in the populations that succumb to colony collapse disorder. But this is the other thing. The more bees aren't not. dying. They're not just dying at the colony. They're leaving the colony. No, they're, they're flying away. No, they're, they're dying. No, they're not. They're not finding dead bees all over the place. They're just taking off and dying elsewhere, dying alone because okay. they're not part of the colony anymore. Okay. That's what they're I've heard. Else. All right. Anyway, it's the end of our show. I'd like to give a shout out to Ed Dyer for his help in finding outstanding stories for us. Herb As Wood, always, he's, he's Herb, great. Herb Wood in Sonora, California. Keep on drinking. And uh, JT in Maryland, uh, who informed us about the Hong Kong health clubs using Justin's ideas. And Robert, who wants us to stop saying Al Gore won an Oscar. It was the filmmaker who actually won the Oscar. But, you know, it's just fun to say that Al Gore is responsible Al Gore gets for everything. The, I bet you anything he's got the Oscar <laughs> at his house. Sorry about that. We are out. Out, out, out for this week. No more time left for us. We'll be back next week with more science news for you and your friends and family and possibly an interview if I can set it up. If somebody sat here and filmed us doing the show and they won an Oscar, I would still say it was ours. <laughs> if you learned anything from today's show, remember. It is all in your head. Thanks once again to AudibleKids.com for supporting this hour of This Week in Science. Brilliant. So glad they thought of it. Brilliant.